Word up, Georgia Japan here with uh, more information about a Japanese TV show. Today I'm going to be talking about one of my most favorite variety shows, Itta Q. If you don't know what Itta Q is, well, gosh, actually the show has changed a lot. It was originally about traveling all around the world to solve these rather trivial mysteries. But these days, they've added in a lot of segments, and I guess it's kind of evolved into a different show. It's a good change, trust me. Anyway, so I figure I'll do something like what I've been doing with uh, Wednesdays Downtown. I'm going to be chronicling really awesome stuff from the show. So kind of the same format. I'm going to introduce the segment. I'm going to give background information about it. I'm going to summarize what happened on the show. And then I'll have like my commentary and opinion mixed into that. And if that sounds good to you, please leave a like and a comment and I'll get started on working on another episode. So yeah, without further ado, let's begin. First segment. Emoto versus a Komodo dragon. Yeah, this is the very first episode of the Rare Wildlife Hunter segment. Um, I actually talked about it in a biography I did about Emoto. If you want to know more about the events leading up to it, please check out that video. Anyway, I think this segment is a really important part of Itaku's history. Not just being for the first Rare Wildlife Hunter segment, but this was the turning point for Itaku. Before this segment, Itaku had never really achieved top ratings. But this is the point where they actually beat the most popular drama in ratings. So I guess you could say, thanks to Emoto and Ishizaki director, ITQ is where it is today. So anyway, after being selected via foot race, Emoto was quickly sent off to the island of Komodo. I guess back in the early episodes of ITQ, they were trying to be kind of educational, so they were giving a lot of information about the Komodo dragon. So anyway, uh, the show really wanted to make sure that the Komodo dragon got really close to Emoto before initiating the race. <laughs> they got, that thing got really close to her. So the Komodo dragon's coming closer and closer, and Ishizaki director finally says, start, just bolts off, and the Komodo dragon chases after her. Yeah, of course, she, she, was, she was much faster than the dragon. The part that I liked the most, though, was that um, pri right before the race, they were telling her, like, oh my god, Emoto, whatever you do, don't fall. You, you'll seriously die if this thing bites you, so whatever you do, don't fall. And if you watch like Japanese variety, when, when people say like, oh, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, in variety it means, so I should do it? They're like, no, no, gosh, don't, don't fall. We're not instructing you to do that. While she was in her mad dash towards the guide, she did fall flat on her face. Luckily, the Komodo dragon was pretty far away, but she recovered in one sixth of a second. This is down, boom, instantly back up. That, that was pretty remarkable. Um, some background information for you. I recently discovered that in a commentary from Emoto that she actually did two races, one that was never aired. Uh, in the first race, she was going to be up against three Komodo dragons. Again, this is like Emoto's first work in variety. It's her first time working with Ishizaki director. Now they're like friends. But yeah, she said that they had three Komodo dragons ready and she was getting, you know, in her start position and Ishizaki director's telling her, don't, don't go until I say go, just wait. And Emoto's really nervous and anxious and she keeps looking behind her and the three Komodo dragons start like running towards her. You know, Ishizaki director didn't say go, but she went. Oh man, just, she, she got chewed out by him. You don't understand variety. You don't go until I say go. Kind of a dark part of variety, actually, but interesting to know. Next, Dance of the Flyers Festival. I forgot what it was called in Spanish. So yeah, this festival involves Miyagawa Daisuke, and he's known as the Festival Man. His segments involve finding out which festival is the most exciting in the world. Love these segments. Yeah, he's done a lot of amazing things, but I think this is his first like, really big festival. So Dance of the Flyers, uh, it's a festival in parts of Mexico. They have this really tall pole. The one they were climbing was 35 meters. They climb to the top of it, they attach a rope, and they spin and dance all the way back to the ground. It's, it's, it's amazing. I don't think they use the festival calendar anymore, or not so much at least, but yeah, back in the early days of Festival Man, He'd have a calendar, he'd like flip through it and just grab one randomly to decide his festival. And he got this one. So they flew to Mexico. The thing I really love about the Festival Man stuff is he's a regular dude. Mia Galadaisuke is a regular dude. He, I think he's 38 here, or 36. Just a regular dude. He has no training in this kind of stuff. But he just shows up and he's like, hey, hi. This is a really cool festival. Could I take part in it? And they're like, I don't 
think you can do it, guy. So can I at least try? All right. So they took him to a practice pole, still pretty high up. He climbs up. He's scared, but he does it on his first try. It really impressed the local people. And he asks him, you know, could, could I take part in your festival? I know it's a big thing, but I would love to be a part of your festival. And they accept him. He, he got to Mexico that day. He took, he did one practice. He could only practice for a really short period of time because there was rain. And then the festival is the next day. So yeah, it's a festival day. He climbs up the 35 meter pole to the top. It's a sacred, very traditional part of their culture. And he's trying to be really respectful about it. But he gets up to the top and fear just takes over. He realizes he's 35 meters up in the air. And yeah, if he falls, he's gonna die. <laughs> he's doing this for a TV show. He, he, a lot of different things are going through his mind right now. You can see it on his face. And then they play that like, flute. It's a part of the, the ceremony, it's a, part of, it's a part of this festival. And somehow that just calms him down. I guess that's why they do it. They just, he starts breathing normally again, and leans back and he does it, he flies. Oh, in two days. How do you do that in two days? That is awesome. Daisuke's efforts were picked up by the local news and he was interviewed and several articles were written about him. One in particular said, it was a Japanese comedian that brought light back to a culture that is being lost. Unfortunately, most of the newspapers uh, misspelled the show's name and got Daisuke's name wrong. Anyway, mo more backstory. Um, in a commentary, he told that after this, he just cried with the staff. He couldn't believe he did it. Also, in an interview, he was asked, uh, like, what festival would you never want to do again? And he said, this, this is the one. This, is the, this was the scariest festival for him. The festival man, I, I just love his spirit of never giving up. Sometimes he does pretty ridiculous things, but it's still inspiring. Next. How much weight could you lose if you spent 24 hours in the Sahara? So um, this segment involves Mori Sanchu. Uh, nowadays on ITQ, they just have like this kind of hot spring tour where they travel around to pretty safe places actually. They, they do extreme stunts, but I, I say it's pretty safe because they're not going into the jungle or, you know, they're not in the wild, but in the earlier years, they, they actually did go out more. So they weighed him and they hired a local guide. Actually, his whole family came along. It was, it, it, I think it's something that you don't really see so much on ITQ these days because Mori Sanchu and that family kind of had this bonding experience while traveling through this, the Sahara. Is this kind of really endearing cultural exchange, but it was kind of ruined at the end. I, I don't know if the directors planned it that way or not, but um, yeah, they're given a certain amount of water. You know, they're traveling the Sahara. Water is so vital and so limited, and they're told to ration it. But Mori Sanchi just guzzle through it. They exhausted their water supply. In this really touching act, the, the little girl, she's like, if you try and call your water, you can have mine. She, she offers her water to them. And they, they fight over it and they, they guzzle it down and it's actually pretty dark. <laughs> Again, I, I, I don't know how much of that was planned because uh, the, the reason I suspect this was planned is that they were within a couple hours of a, of a well. So I think the directors wanted to catch something dark. I, I don't know, it's just a theory. Anyway, so they safely reached their destination and they weighed them. They, they had, I think it was like two kilos or something. They, they lost a little bit of weight. <laughs> I don't know what the show was expecting, honestly. It's just 24 hours. That's just water weight, right? <laughs> Next. Where is the most relaxing spot on earth? I'm uh, gonna have to explain this one a little bit more. It's not exactly the most relaxing spot on earth. It has to do with a minus eon. What is that called? Like negative? air ionization. Actually, most of the scientific community considers it a pseudoscience. But anyway, so this negative air ionization is like a relaxation therapy. The show tried to explain it. It kind of just went over my head. But anyway, uh, so this negative air ionization occurs naturally in the world. And they found that it happens the most at 
the foot of a waterfall. So the show decided to go to the tallest waterfall in the world, Angel Falls, but um, they later found out that the water evaporates mid-fall. So they decided to go to a different waterfall, forget the name, it's, it was this one. I know that, that sounds pretty wonky, but the reason why I think this segment is really important is that it's Tegoshi's very first segment. Tegoshi has really evolved on the show. This is back when he was 19 years old. He was still like a straight arrow, like a very serious, respectful um, idol. Now he's a... Uh... Damn, how do you translate Chadai? Thanks, DMM. So yeah, now he's this like wild, funny, <laughs> kind of shallow dude. Honestly, I think he's hilarious, but yeah, anyway, so this is back, his very first segment, and he was paired up with this kid. I don't know who this kid is, I just know that he likes bugs. So they fly him over, and yeah, this waterfall is really out of the way. They get there, they have to get onto a smaller plane. This is super bumpy. Kid was like terrified. They get off, they have to hike through the jungle. And there's a lot of venomous and poisonous stuff in there. They brought a kid? You don't really see kids on Itaku. I think this is the reason why, it's just dangerous. And the kid could not keep up with the adult's pace on the hike. Anyway, so they got to the spot and it was raining, which caused the waterfall to like overflow. And they were supposed to go down this slope to get to the foot of the waterfall, but because the waterfall was just overflowing, that hiking path was gone. So the, the, they were in a real bind here. The show decided to contact pro rock climbers to see if they could kind of repel down. The rock climbers made no promises, but said they would just try getting there. And they actually got there in the morning. When they got there, they're like, no, mm -mm. no, nah, you cannot repel down that. Tegoshi was surprisingly adamant about getting footage though. He's like, okay, if you can't get to the bottom of the waterfall, then how about we just go down the waterfall? The, the pros are kind of laughing, that's really dangerous. You sure you want to do that? And he's like, yeah, I want to do it. And he convinces them to go down as far as they can with him, which actually isn't that far. It, it's still pretty impressive that Tegoshi went down that. But yeah, since they couldn't go down that far, the data they found was no different from a regular waterfall. And they climb back up. And Tegoshi is determined that if they go down further, they're gonna get like some crazy readings. So he's pleading with the pro rock climbers to go further. And they're like, no, we can't carry you that far. He's like, okay, then how about if you guys just go? Really, you want that information that bad? What is this negative ionization? What is this? Like, come on, please. Just go as far as you can. Like, fine, fine, you, God, you really want it, okay. And they go down as far as they can. And they take a reading. And they get this really crazy number. And the show declares that the most relaxing spot in the world is this spot. Yeah, that is not the most relaxing spot in the world. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. Do I got time for one more? <sighs> okay, really quick. Last one. Can you grate wasabi? off of a man-eating shark. Okay, so a little bit of background. The traditional tool for uh, grating wasabi uses shark skin, and it's usually from a very specific type of shark. So the show is wondering, what if you use a different kind of shark? Could you still grate wasabi? Honestly, I, I think we know the answer. The answer is yes. Sharks don't really have that different um, skin, right? But I, I guess the show really wanted footage of Degawa riding a shark. Oh yeah, that's right, this segment involves Degawa. Um, Degawa does a lot of stuff on the show now, but back in the early years, he was still trying to do this uh, mystery solving stuff. So the show goes to Australia. They meet a crew of uh, fishermen. I really like Degawa's uh, effort in trying to communicate in English. If I had this man's confidence in Japanese back when I was studying it, I would be a much better speaker. So they go out into the ocean, they fish for snapper to use as chum for the shark, and they fish up a tiger shark. <sighs> the big tiger shark, they had to use a metal chain to fish for it. It's just so powerful. That is a powerful, powerful shark. So they're dragging it up onto the boat, and Degawa mounts it, like, like he's the one restraining it, and they grate wasabi on a tiger shark. Dang. I don't know 
know why it was that like brownish color. It wasn't really green. I don't know if they used a different type of wasabi. But anyway, uh, they made sushi from the snapper they had caught earlier. They put a little bit of the wasabi on it and they ate it. So it was delicious. Yeah, I'm not a member of PETA or anything, but I gotta admit, I felt a little bad for that shark to be fished up out of the water, have a Japanese comedian jump on top of him, and then have wasabi grated on it. That's a real shitty day for the shark, but a real spectacle to see. Anyway, that's uh, all the stuff I got for today. Um, I wanna thank everybody for tuning in. I'm definitely seeing like more growth on the channel and I'm so happy for that. And I hope I'll be able to bring you content at a faster rate. But yeah, thank you so much. Have a glorious day.